remembered. Uh, this is COMP 422 and COMP 620 Information Privacy and Security. And today we're talking about malware. Uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, malicious things out there. We've got viruses and worms and Trojan horses and rabbits and all sorts of things. Uh, I love this picture I got out here. And uh, the biohazard uh, symbol there. And just to say something, my father helped make the biohazard symbol years ago, years ago. Uh, okay, uh, malware, why do they have it? Well, uh, it's malicious. It's there to steal things. They steal information. It was to your password, your credit card number. Uh, it's a personal computer. In corporate information, they want to steal everything. They want to steal, again, more of the credit card numbers, the account numbers, the list of people. They want to steal trade secrets. Uh, we've all heard of ransomware, which I'll talk more about today. Uh, it spreads through uh, phishing. Uh, sometimes the goals are relatively benign. Uh, sometimes they just want to get more computers to perform calculations. It may be calculations to try to break somebody's uh, encryption key and they need lots of computing power to do it. So they go out and steal it from other people's computers. Create botnets and networks of uh, computers that will do what you want. Uh, occasionally they'll install software to do other nefarious activities. Uh, click fraud, we're not talk too much about click fraud today. And, and occasionally, occasionally the malware will actually break a real world physical system. The first animal in our zoo of malware is the Trojan horse. Uh, Trojan horse is pretty straightforward. People write a program to do something, something that you want done, something that you want to execute. And while it's doing what you want, behind the scenes, it's also doing something that you don't want, something uh, usually uh, well, malicious goes out there. And whatever activity is malicious, it can be almost anything. I might note as uh, Christmas is coming, occasionally you'll see these greeting cards programs. There'll be um, an executable you can download to display pretty picture of Christmas trees with blinking lights or something. Those, those are loaded with malware. Those are tra Trojan horses. They have all sorts of things running in the background while it's showing you the blinking lights. Avoid those. Never execute an executable that comes with email. I think most email systems will in fact filter those out. I gotta tell you about a, uh, a Trojan horse program that worked many years ago. Uh, this ran on a UNIVAC computer in the 1980s and I was the manager of systems programming at the time and was tasked with trying to fix the problem. It was the animal program. The animal program was benign. It did not do anything nasty to your account or the computer. All it did was copy itself into other directories. Uh, in that sense, it was a worm. We'll talk about worms and Trojan horses and viruses. Yes, it copied itself. And when you ran it, any directory that was write enabled, it would write into it, hoping, of course, that someday some foolish system administrator would be uh, running with uh, root privileges and stupidly run the program, and then everything would be infected. Uh, I'll tell you about it. It was, a, it was a fun program. It was a very simple animal guessing game. You thought of an animal and it tried to guess what it was. And it would go down the usual animal taxonomy, uh, ask you the questions. And if it came to the end and it didn't know the animal you were thinking of, it would ask you about that animal and add it to its database. Uh, it was a real computer science algorithms problem because it also optimize the frequency of responses. I know about decision trees, hopefully they talk to that and uh, data structures and algorithms. You can balance them out. If, if people are always going down one path, you move some of the decisions from that path up near the top. So you don't have to go 10 questions down before you ask, start asking the important questions first. Yes, uh, it eventually got down to the first question that I asked was, does the animal have fangs? And if you said yes, it asked, well, is it Dr. Ottenstein? Uh, one of the computer science faculty. Because the game was fun and because it picked on the faculty, uh, it got played a lot. So every time you ran it, of course, it would copy itself into other directories if it wasn't already there. 
uh, as the uh, manager of systems programming, we decided that since the computer was a university resource, that well, game was benign, but we weren't here to play games, and that the uh, program was producing itself all over. So I wrote a program to go out and delete any executable to name animal. I don't know if I accidentally stepped on anybody else's programs, but we deleted them all, and it seemed to at least slow it down. There's other Trojan horses out there. There's adware. Adware is also can be benign. It just displays advertisements on your computer. Typically, if you got infected every now and again, only about you know once a day or so, so it doesn't, so you don't notice it as well. Once a couple of times a day, it will pop up an ad, tell you, you know, do you want to buy this? Click here for something. Another version of this is it will change your uh, home page on your browser. So instead of going to uh, Google or Microsoft, or wherever it goes by default, it goes to their homepage. Uh, now, other adware, in addition to uh, showing ads, is doing other nefarious activities in the background, uh, copying your private data and sending it off to headquarters. Spyware is very similar, except it doesn't show the advertisements. It tries to be as quiet and silent and as invisible as it can, and quietly collects information about you and sends it off to headquarters. Okay, another commonly seen uh, malicious software is computer viruses. Computer viruses uh, are named such because they infect other programs. You start a computer virus running in one program and it will infect all other executable programs that it can write to. Um, it's similar to a Trojan horse, except a Trojan horse was written with the virus intentionally built into it, whereas a virus infects other programs. So you might have, oh, let's say Microsoft Word out there, and you run this program as a virus, and it will infect your Microsoft Word. So every time you run Microsoft Word, now it runs the virus. Basically, here's how it operates. Uh, you start with your original executable, the uh, safe one that's writable uh, that you not the one that's affected, but the one that's in a writable directory when you execute the program. The virus will then write itself to the end of the executable. Cop this is the, this bar is supposed to represent the first executable instruction. It copies that first executable instruction to the end, changes that to a jump to the virus. So when the program first starts, it jumps in, starts executing the virus code. The virus code runs for a while and then executes that first line, jumps back to the line after the virus to run this number. Now, frequently, these things are pretty clever, and they will be start a second thread, another thread to run the virus activity in the background. So it almost immediately goes back running the main purpose of the program with the virus running in the background. So you don't notice anything operating inappropriately. Everybody should have antivirus software on their system. I think uh, this is by University PC. It comes with antivirus software. Uh, and virus software is basically a pattern match. They have what they call signatures or patterns displayed by the virus software. As the imagine the machine code of the virus, they know what that looks like, and they search for that particular machine code. They scan through it, and so uh, anytime you write to it to a file, it scans it to see if that contains a matching known pattern script of, of one of the known viruses. Of course, that means they only know about previously caught viruses. So if you create a new, if you create a new virus all by yourself, your antivirus system probably will not find it. Not until it gets out in the wild, as they say, and people start to complain about it and the virus companies find out about it, will it appear in the virus scanners patterns. Virus scanners often, or antivirus software, often do other activities too to protect you. Uh, if you're writing into executables, that's usually considered a problem. Uh, generally, most programs do not write into an executable. Very few do, and if they're doing, they're probably doing something that you don't want, so they can watch that. Of course, uh, sometimes there are programs that do write uh, executables. As programmers, people write programs that create executables. Now, since these antivirus software is going out scanning for viruses, the viruses are working hard trying to hide themselves. 
Uh, they do that basically by encrypting themselves. They don't use AES encryption, it's something very simple. Typically exclusive ordering the virus code with a constant, usually a random number. They will, during the infection phase, they'll dream up a random number and then save that in the infected code and then exclusive or that random number with the uh, machine language that they're hiding. So it will look different every time. And even if they get really sophisticated, they will change that uh, random value in a predictable way. They'll add a number to it or something. And so it's different every time they, ex they exclusive or another line of the virus. So it makes it very difficult to find the virus. The only thing they can find is that initial code that encrypts it or decrypts it, which is usually relatively small. There's only, you can do this in a half dozen uh, instructions to encrypt the whole thing. Uh, so it makes it harder and harder to find. In addition to viruses that infect executables, you can also have viruses that affect macros. A uh, number of programming systems allow you to do macros or record steps that will execute automatically. Uh, the Microsoft Office suite of programs does that. Uh, if you want a macro that says something, a series of instructions in Excel spreadsheets, you can record them, save them in the file. And so when another user gets that file, if you send that file, that additional functionality will be in the file for them to use, which is a really nice feature, except sometimes that additional functionality isn't all that you want. It may be doing something malicious, something that you don't want. So we have to watch out that. If you download a document, either from a website or from email, Microsoft will say, oh, wait a second, this thing was downloaded. Uh, are you sure you want to run it as a virus? Unfortunately, it doesn't provide a button that says delete all the viruses. It just says either run it or don't. All right, here's our first question for this morning. For this afternoon, get those uh, forms out. Let's launch this online. Yeah, oh, of course they have extra. Give them back. All right. Okay, uh, uh, well, 58% of the online people have well, more than that have answered the question and they're doing very well, I might mention. Uh, guys are tough. Uh, all right, here in our live studio audience. Come on, there we go. Uh, Okay. Uh, B is, is very popular. Yes, B, there's always some wise guy. Uh, now, running the program from removal media does not do it for you. It runs just the same from removal media as it does from a hard drive. That doesn't have any impact. Uh, in fact, you might also infect the removal media and including your, and your computer. Uh, spraying your, your computer with disinfectant is not effective. So I thought about that. <laughs> okay, so, oh, yes, and uh, uh, hang on here. We can get this mouse to behave. Uh, you can see uh, the results there. Okay. All right, how do you fix viruses? Of course, antivirus software, right to it. you can also uh, put digital signatures on the executables. Uh, most operating systems, Mac OS, Microsoft Windows do, does that now, that the executables are digitally signed by the manufacturer and the operating system uh, checks the digital signature before it executes the program as it goes to load. That way, if you were to infect it, change the executable because the executable, uh, again, is part of, part of the checksum of the 
Now the checksum won't come out correct and the digital signature will fail. So the operating system will know that you've changed it. Of course, disabling writing to an existing executable file uh, helps a lot. It's not a complete fix because alternatively, the program may write another file, call it a text file, with, which is really the executable. And then when it, after it's done writing it, just do a name change back to the executable. And of course, remember that software developers like us uh, create executables. Another thing that should be done is making uh, directories that contain the software read only. This works particularly well if you don't have the ability to uh, change that. Now, if you are running as administrator on your on your laptop, and many people do, uh, if you run as administrator, then you have the right to make it unread only. And then, so if a program wants to infect it, you can make directly unread only, uh, infect it, switch it back to read only. But if it's installed by administrator, you can make the directory read only without the without your ability to change it. Therefore, you can't change the program. Having tried to support uh, lab, student labs here at the university for a long time. It's really nice if the software installation can be made read-only, then you can't mess it up. A uh, couple real quick review of some early viruses that are out there. This guy, Fred Cohen is a graduate student, uh, wrote a virus, his, his advisor named it a computer virus. Uh, and, his goal was to get super user privileges on a Unix system, uh, which he managed to do. Never took him more than an hour and got the record was five minutes. It managed an average. So we tried it. He, also, he was doing a good job. So he tried to make sure it was easily removed. There are other ones. Uh, brain one uh, infected floppies back in 86. And then I like the, the peace virus. All it did is on a particular day, it would print universal message of peace on the screen. And that was all it did, it deleted itself. Uh, that's a logic bomb, we'll talk about that in a little while. Uh, other experiments, uh, small virus spread pretty quickly. Uh, and then the Lotus one, two, three virus is interesting. All it did was change one specific cell, a particular row and column. Uh, I think it saved that value someplace else, but it did that just to tell you it was there. One of the problems, of course, with the early computers, I'm thinking particularly Microsoft DOS. We're talking, you know, back in the 80s, you're running Microsoft uh, DOS. Windows 92 didn't come out until 92. And so people didn't have Windows and the early DOS had no protection at all. It was meant to run on IBM 8086. It wasn't until the IBM 80 386, did they have virtual memory and memory protection? So the operating system was in low memory and your program could change it if it wanted to. Uh, you can probably write to the uh, boot sector of the disk and change the operating system there. So the next time it booted, it had your modified version. We'll talk about uh, rooting in a little bit. Also, if you were booting off a floppy disk, uh, you could write that. Although floppy disks could be physically uh, write protected. There was a write protect tab. And if you put write protect uh, sleeve on it, then you could not write to it, which was always wise. Some thumb drives have write protect buttons on them. Not too many anymore, but they're really nice. If I, I had a couple and if I was going to give a student some software, I'd write it on the software, write it on my thumb drive, take it out of my machine click the right protect button, put it in their laptop, copy it, and I get take it back. And I know they did not infect the thumb drive because it was physically right protected. Thinking of thumb drives, finding a thumb drive is a, is a way to spread software. Uh, a lot of people spread malicious software by putting them on thumb drives and just nearly dropping that thumb drive on the floor, or where it might be found, or leaving it in a machine, in the lab, or, or, or the library, or someplace where someone might find and they go, oh, look, somebody left this. Well, I've got a free thumb drive. Bad idea. Because uh, people then put that free thumb drive in their computer, and lo and behold, it starts up, and part of it's opening up, it will execute programs in the startup and infect your computer. Uh, 
people did a study on this. Of course, that's what academics do. They created a benign uh, program on the thumb drive. And all it did was report back to their computer, their headquarters, that that particular thumb drive had been found and plugged in. Turns out it didn't take long. If, you know, once they dropped them, boy, almost immediately those things start showing up in their list of found thumb drives. Uh, and about half of them were plugged into a computer. Although I might mention about 8% of them, the person plugged them into somebody else's computer, just to make sure they, they plug them into a university computer, uh, check and see if it was okay, format it, and then put it in their computer. So the, the moral of the story is never put a thumb drive in your computer if you just find it. That is a way that people have been spreading viruses for a long time. Uh, it's, it's a tricky way to get it done. So don't fall victim to that one. Okay, uh, you mentioned just briefly the idea of writing into the boot sector. Let me talk a little about uh, rooting and boot viruses. Uh, to, for a little background, I'll explain the booting process for those who aren't particularly familiar with it. Okay, boot, of course, is bootstrap or uh, IBM systems used to call it initial program load. Uh, when you turn on the computer, it's got to get the operating system started. And it's not as easy and simple as it looks. Uh, several things it wants to do. Usually the hardware does some sort of test. Is this machine working correctly? Uh, I do, you know, I check the arithmetic, check the uh, CPU, check other devices. <laughs> Having written power on te self tests myself, it's challenging to go out there and see if all your hardware is working correctly. Is everything going to interrupt when it's supposed to and not interrupt when it's not supposed to and other things. Uh, of course, in your laptop, you might have changed something since you turned it off. You know, you can open this thing up, plug in different equipment. It's gotta be able to find it. it. Has to be able to reset all the hardware back to a workable state, set up your execution environment. That means the virtual memory and everything. And finally, start the operating system, which will then start other things. It's a combination of the hardware, the firmware, and the software. The firmware is software that's in a read-only memory. It's, doesn't, uh, it's not changeable. Read-only memory, as the name implies, is read-only. But it's not as read-only as you might think. Uh, BIOS, the basic input-output system, for many years was the firmware that interfaced between the hardware and the software in the operating system and the hardware that you had. And it was also the software that started your machine and helped boot your machine. It's been around for ages before the IBM PC was even invented. While it's in read-only memory, it's in what's called electrically programmable read-only memory, EEPROM. Uh, and EEPROM cannot be written by normal operations. If you just do a store from this register into there, it will, will give you an error. But there is a mechanism to change it. That's how you, know, you have your uh, firmware in your laptop and your desktop. And every now and again, your computer manufacturer will say, oh, we'd like to put an upgrade into that. And they'll provide you an upgrade. I think my, I think this computer I'm using right now decided this afternoon that it wanted to upgrade the firmware. It took a long time when I was busy trying to get here. But uh, yes, and so it upgrades. So in order to upgrade, you have to be able to write into the firmware. Then since there's a mechanism to allow them to upgrade, that same mechanism could be used maliciously to change the firmware for some malicious purpose. It's a little bit challenging, but it can be done. BIOS got old and has been abandoned in the favor of unified extensible firmware interface, UEFI. UEFI has several advantages. UEFI supports large address spaces. Of it. I think BIOS didn't go past four gigabytes. Uh, bit, and large disks and stuff like that. Also, the most important thing, particularly for this class, is that it provides boot security. BIOS did nothing for security. So when you turn on your computer, it starts executing instructions. And the first instruction it executes is typically in the firmware, the BIOS or UEFI, and starts executing the firmware instructions that will go through the boot process. It starts loading loaders. Sorry. Uh, usually there's multiple sequences of loading things. You first load a small program and the master boot record is only 446 bytes. That's a pretty small program. 
It loads that and that program loads another loader and that loader probably loads another loader until you get the thing going. Uh, and then there's other things that happen at startup. Many applications want to do something on a periodic basis. The startup seems some of them would be a good time to do it. A lot of them will check your computer viruses. Now it's time to do a virus scan, which I always found interesting because this, your computer is at its very safest when it's turned off. And after it's been turned off, you turn it back on, and now it's going to check it for viruses in case it caught one while it was turned off. Anyway, also a lot of computers, a lot of programmers look for software updates at that point. And of course, all this makes your computer take longer to boot up. Sometimes it's useful to go out to the, oh, let's see if I can do this. Uh, okay, but stop sharing the screen for a minute. Hello, everybody. Okay. Go down here, uh, task manager. Oh, uh, share screen. Okay. Everybody out there in uh, internet land should be able to see the task manager here. Uh, you can see that there's yes. also, thank you. Uh, there's a tab called startup. These are the programs that start when your computer starts. Uh, there's a whole lot of them. Many manufacturers create software and they can't imagine you'd ever want to turn your computer on and not run their software. Why would you? Uh, you can see that I have about half of them disabled. I don't want that to start when I, I don't use that. I don't want that to start when I uh, start up my, so oh, I have all those disabled. I have a couple of them that are necessary. Uh, Surface DTX runs the mouse in this machine. That's kind of useful. Uh, Security notification, I kind of like that. And one of the things that also mentions over here is the impact. Oh, how much time does this thing take? And you can see like some of them, like Microsoft OneDrive, has got a high impact. It makes your startup take longer. So uh, if it becomes a problem, I would, if I were you, go through this list, which is not, by the way, complete. Unfortunately, the task manager doesn't find them all and disable those that you think you don't ever want to run. You know, if you come around and go, oh, I don't use Skype. So you just right click it and you can click the disable, which now it says enable. I don't want to enable it. And disable the ones you want. Make sure your computer run faster. Because remember, these things are running all the time. Get rid of those things. Okay. All right. So we can get back and uh, share my screen correctly. Uh, all right. We're back to the slides. But now you should have seen that I have a, another question here. So let's try uh, this question. Okay, well, here in in classroom, let's put your cards up so I can. I think you got your finger over. Okay, yeah, keep your yeah. It, it's sensitive that it has to read the whole thing, right? Okay, good enough. All right. Uh yes. Okay, I didn't fool many people on this one. Yes, the answer, as most of you guessed, is all of the above. Each one of these, you can write to the boot sector. Modify the OS files and disk, get the Windows directory, the operating system is hiding out there, change those files and you change the operating system. And of course, we mentioned changing the BIOS or UEFI will do it. So all these are possible. Okay, did I show that? Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Being a guy with an old gray beard who's written programs for a long time, I quickly tell you about the uh, booting process from the machine I worked on. It was a communications front end, uh, and it took several steps to boot it up. First, in the front panel, you typed in a series of uh, hexadecimal numbers that represented a very short program, only about a dozen, only knew about a dozen of them, so it didn't take too long. Then you pressed start button on that and the start button on a teletype that read a paper tape. It was a paper tape is about an inch wide, has holes in it. 
and maybe yards long. Uh, and it runs through the machine and the holes, of course, represent a byte of data. And it reads that into the memory of the computer. After the whole tape is run through the machine, you stop, then you type in the uh, beginning address of the loader and you press go and it starts running. And that loader loads another program down the communications line. Yes, this was a project long ago. Uh, this computer did not have an operating system. They just gave me the computer and said, here, write this program and make it work. Uh, no OS, so we, we had, to write the, uh, had to write the program on the, on the uh, paper tape, make up those dozen bytes to write in, wrote the program that it downloaded, wrote the program that, it, that downloaded it, wrote the program on the communications on both sides that ran. So, And then when it failed, it uploaded a memory dump to the machine. I wrote a program that printed that out. So it was a project that I worked on. Kept me employed for a while. Okay, but I learned a lot because I had to do everything. Rootkits. Okay, rootkits are a threat to machines and they modify your operating system or add to your operating system. You can add code that will run before your OS runs. During the boot process, if the machine is infected, it will add programs into the system that are executed before your operation. So before anything's out there to protect you, before your antivirus or anything's running, uh, the rootkit program can go out there and modify things. And then it can hide itself. How do you hide itself? The easy way to hide itself is put itself somewhere where that is not a file. For instance, uh, you got a terabyte drive. Well, out of that eight terabyte of bits out there, there's probably at least one that doesn't work. I mean, you know, they try to make these things as uh, correct as they can, but you, as you're mass producing these things, probably one bit doesn't work well. Well, they test these things, they find a bit, so all they do on the drive is they make this, as they uh, mark this block that has the bad bit as a bad sector. Don't use this sector, it's bad. And then the operating system will not put files in that sector. And you can have, if it later it discovers more bad sectors, it can put them on the bad sector list. It just keeps you from allocating files to the top of the parts of this that don't work right. Because they're physical machines, they do break. Uh, well, malicious software could add blocks to the bad block list and then hide itself in there. So nothing's going to play with it because everything you think, if you try to read that, you're going to get an error. Uh, and of course, they can put them in many places at many different levels. You can overwrite the firmware. They change the you, uh, the BIOS, or again, change the bootloader. We'll talk about several steps here. Change the kernel, that's part of the operating system that runs at the highest level, and some of the drivers. Another favorite thing is to change some of the OS drivers. Uh, the operating system has to deal with also different pieces of hardware. You're just made by many different manufacturers, and some of the hardware has a driver or software that controls that device made by the device manufacturer. If you have a network card, there are all sorts of network chip, all sorts of network chips. And so the operating system has a, a driver for the different network chips to make the work correct. And these drivers are made by somebody, and they can be infected. Most computers now have something called the Trusted Platform Module or TPM. It's a microcontroller added to the machine or built into the CPU chip or, or the chip set uh, that uh, handles cryptography and part of the boot process. Make sure that everything starts without being corrupted. It does cryptographic uh, encryption and keys, or excuse me, signatures of the boot process of all the software. So when you boot, you know you're getting software that was created by this company, say created by Microsoft or created by Intel and not modified by somebody else. Uh, Windows 11 requires that your computer have TPM. Uh, there are several steps. I went out and looked at the Windows boot security. Uh, there's several steps involved. There's secure boot. Again, that's, that works with the trusted platform module and the BIOS or UEFI, oh, that's UEFI, the firmware. And so it checks those and then starts the boot. And then uh, got the trusted boot, the early anti-malware. I'll talk about I'll talk about more of these in just a minute in detail. Here's the big picture. 
you start with the uh, secure boot and the UEFI in the firmware, it passes it off to trusted boot, which does the OS loader, starts the kernel, execute that's the main center of the operating system, which then loads drivers that have to be checked and then system files more and more. And again, the third party drivers, the ones that are not made by Microsoft, and all these are then loaded. Part bit by bit. All of it, by the way, uh, there's a logging system. So when things don't work, you can report back to headquarters. Yes, so the secure boot, again, by Microsoft, uh, it works with UEFI, which works with T TPM, Trusted Platform Module. I gotta get all my uh, acronyms correct. Make sure that everything's digitally signed. If it is digitally signed, then it'll execute it, copy it in the, in the memory, check that it's running, and then passes control off to the trusted uh, Trusted boot, trusted boot is the next step. Trusted boot loads the Windows bootloader and checks that it's properly done. And then run and then runs the bootloader, which runs the which loads the operating system. And as the operating system loads, it checks the boot driver. Boot drivers are the ones that were made by Microsoft, so it has some sense of uh, assured is that those are going to be correct. Runs the startup files and launches something called the early launch anti malware driver. That's an anti-malware program. Now your normal malware, if you have uh, McAfee or, or whoever uh, software out there that you run to keep your machine safe, uh, that hasn't started yet. This launch is early. Now it might be that uh, the early launch anti-malware is either Microsoft or made by some other party, that, uh, but it launches and it's checking the integrity of the boot drivers when they Lost. So it goes out there, make sure that they are correct. Also, not only are they properly signed, but they're on the list of trusted drivers. If they aren't on the list of trust, trusted drivers and they don't have the signature of the list of trusted drivers, they don't run. Another computer that's often uh, rooted when that is changed the boot drive is Android phones. Uh, Apple phones are slight, run slightly different. You can jailbreak an Apple phone, but that's a slightly different process. I don't talk about Android phones. Android phones, there is a way to go out there and change the boot so it does not boot the standard Google Android OS. There are reasons you might want to do this. Uh, it gives you full control. Uh, Google doesn't let you do everything your phone might do. There are software on your uh, phone that you can't get rid of and you might not want there. Thinking of talk about privacy on Wednesday, there are software out there that keeps track of what you're doing and you might not want that to run, but you can't remove it. Uh, Google won't let you, Android won't let you. If you root your phone, you can do whatever you want. Basically what rooting is, is it gives you administrative access to the machine and you can do whatever you want to. Another thing you can do is you can change your phone carrier because you're, so we're talking phones here. If you don't want to, you want to keep the same phone, but don't want to run on, oh, I don't know, AT&T or Verizon or Spectrum or whoever you have, and you want to switch to some carrier, you can do that. A lot of phones won't let you do that. Really, you can. Now, there are, of course, major disadvantages to booting your phone. Almost all the phone manufacturers say, if you do this, you avoid the warranty. You forget it. It doesn't work. It's your problem. And uh, it's it's not difficult to uh, make a mistake in what they say, brick your phone. That means it is absolutely, totally useless. It, you press the start button and it won't start. It won't do anything. It will not boot. And if it doesn't boot, it doesn't run. It's not a phone, it's not a computer. It's just a little brick. So uh, here's a question for you. Is it illegal to, uh, Root your phone. So let's try that one. Think about that. I haven't told you yet, but you can see what you're. This is an opinion question, sort of. All right. Okay. Think about it for a minute. And hold up your cards in the live studio audience. Wrong side. Yeah. Okay. I got to see. I got to see. Okay. All right. Oh, no. 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 You want to try again? I think I think if you hold it again, I'll, I'll. Okay. 
I'll keep the same answer, but okay, please. Okay, well, the answer is false. It is not. Much of people thought true. They always get the wise guy that is at all of the above, but uh, yeah. I remember the reason why I say it's false because when I first looked at the tree, I don't know, I've done it before. Um, Arrest him. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but it was on my own phone. Yes, well, yes, very much it is, it is legal. In fact, uh, it is illegal in some countries. But in the United States, the Unlocking Consumer Choice and Wireless Competition Act, which is about 10 years old now, I think, uh, makes rooting legal. It explicitly says, you can do this to your phone. And there are competition, you know, people use the competition thing. Well, you can see the Consumer Choice and Wireless Competition Act. The title kind of tells you what they were trying to push it as. Uh, so, well, you know, it's your phone, I suppose, if you want to change it, as long as you don't mess up the uh, phone system. I guess that's, although I can foresee different, you know, I see, you know, like anything in the world, there are positive and negatives. Uh, it was an answer. Yes, I mean, well, I've got, I've got some old, some old Android phones that don't have phone service that I use just for uh, programming. And why should, why shouldn't I root it? Uh, okay, more malicious type software is a computer worm. Computer worm propagates itself. Uh, you might think that the animal program I described earlier, which is a Trojan horse. Uh, computer worms, sometimes you don't have to execute, they will propagate themselves to other methods, uh, pat, send themselves across the network and or by email or through open ports. The most famous one is the great internet worm of uh, 1988. It was the first worm. Uh, I think we, I talked about this earlier, Robert Morris uh, at MIT created this 99 line program and just kind of did it as a test to see if it worked. Well, it worked all right. It disabled thousands of computers for about a day. Uh, yeah, it really messed up. They caught him. Well, he didn't try to hide because he wasn't out to do so much. And they uh, fined him $10,000 and 400 hours of community service. It didn't hurt his career. He went on to get a PhD and now a faculty member at MIT. So I think he teaches computer security. Another famous worm is Stuxnet. Stuxnet uh, is interesting because of its sophistication. Uh, Stuxnet was out there to target the program logic controllers of machines that controlled centrifuges, things that spin around and separate materials, particularly materials for nuclear, mater for nuclear or radioactive materials, separating uranium-238 from uranium-235. Uh, and it basically only attacked those computers that had the right software that looked like it might be a, uh, it is eventually it found its way into Iran, into the Iran nuclear facilities where they centrifuge the uranium. And uh, uh, news reports say that it damaged the Iranian centrifuges. It spun them at a high speed such that they broke. I don't know the details, but uh, yes, so that or earlier versions, Stuxnet like one, tried running it so they wouldn't work correctly. And then Stuxnet version two came out and actually broke them. So it actually broke the hardware, broke physical real world equipment. Uh, it was very sophisticated. Somebody who did it had to have a lot of knowledge of uh, viruses, Microsoft, and of the uh, control system for the centrifuges. Somebody had to know the details of the equipment that controlled the centrifuges, the programmable logic that did that, so they could update that. And it made use of, I think, four previously unknown Microsoft Windows vulnerabilities. So it was very, very uh, sophisticated. And you read the news, I think maybe Israel and or the United States uh, did it. Another animal in our zoo of malware are rabbits. Uh, we have a Trojan rabbit there. The rabbits are programs to just waste time. I think I talked about this earlier. They just consume resources, all sorts of ways to do that. Here's a process one. While true, of course, while true, this is, it means run forever. And this one, four, four command starts another process. You can think of things that, you know, create a new file, create, you know, just while true, create new files, write lots of junk into files, just 
fill up the disk with random files uh, or whatever you want to do to harm your system. That's what a rabbit does. It's just a uh, wasteful consume consumption resources. A nudger, another problem you'll find in malware or logic bombs. Some of them mentioned earlier. A logic bomb, uh, kind of like a Trojan horse. These things mix and match across each other. But a logic bomb is usually something that sits out there and waits. It's software installed on your system serostriposely and then waits for something, either for a message from headquarters or for something to happen. And then it does something else. There was one decades ago, a uh, payroll programmer, the guy who wrote the program that prints the paychecks, they ever fire me, I'm gonna get back. And so he said, if his number, his name or ID number didn't appear when paying, when printing the paychecks, meaning of course that he'd been fired, then it erased the payrolls database. That's a logic bomb. There are a lot of others that do other things out there. Um, they wait for something to happen and they get the control. Uh, botnets, botnets are similar. Botnets are uh, software that's secretly installed in your machine, something like adware or spyware. But generally it just sits there and does nothing until either a particular date or a message from headquarters comes in telling it it's supposed to do something. And they're often used for distributed denial of service, DDoS uh, attacks, where all of a sudden all the computers in the botnet we start sending messages to the poor victim computer to overwhelm it with the thousands of messages from tens of thousands of botnets. Uh, okay, let me talk a little bit about social engineering because we're talking about humans here. And in general, humans are a very weak link in computer security. Humans don't always do what they should. Uh, but basically social engineering is manipulating people, humans, into giving out information they probably shouldn't give out, trying to convince them to give you information. Easiest way to find out somebody's password is to ask them, what's your password? I know that seems so simple, but a lot of people will tell you what their password is. Okay, now you know. Uh, it's, it's a, uh, you think of the confidence guys, the, the fraudsters try to. Uh, users often make bad decisions. I like to you know, reform, reformat the C drive. Oh yeah, okay, whatever. A lot of people press okay on any box that comes up. This would be a disastrous thing to, to press, but yeah, people, you, warning message comes up, they don't care, they're gonna press that button anyway. Uh, I hope my wife doesn't listen to this recording, but boy, she'll press okay for almost anything. Or she just, you know, Oh, you should press the, no, don't press that button. No. <laughs> yeah, she presses whatever. Okay. Uh, so, and people can, you know, we talked about insecure passwords. Many people have insecure passwords. People don't protect the machines. They don't know what they're doing. Uh, phishing, phishing is an effort to convince people to tell you information that you should not divulge. There's all sorts of ways to do it, but it's uh, a method of just, so it comes from uh, phishing, uh, phishing for information. Uh, and it can be done from anywhere. They can send you email, text messages, phone calls, webs, any media that you've got for interfacing with. People have been try phishing, so they try to convince you that they sh that you should give them information that you probably shouldn't give. There's different types. Three of the most popular names, and there are more than three. Spear phishing. Spear phishing means you're targeting particular individuals or companies. You're sending out email. That won't make sense to most people, but makes a lot of sense. So in other words, if you wanna get uh, Fred in the accounting office, you can send an email that looks like it came from Fred's boss. And so Fred will answer it thinking he's responding to, Fred, to his boss when he's not. That's targeted to that guy. Whaling is spear phishing, but a high profile target you're looking for people who can give you big information senior executives who may have lots of access. Actually, you don't want to go for them. You want to go for the security officer who probably knows the passwords to everything, get him. Clone phishing, that's uh, very similar to, to uh, using a legitimate email but attaching files to it. So 
a legitimate email comes through with more in it. And so if you, or you change the link, so if you do something, you're gonna do something you wish you hadn't done. It's very effective. First of all, 95% of all organizations report that they've had some spear phishing or some uh, phishing attack against them. 95%, it's practically everybody. Very few get away without it. Uh, not, not all of this widely successful. Uh, this, uh, now, I went out in preparing the slides, I went out and looked at several websites trying to get the effectiveness and the cost of phishing attacks. The numbers they give me range all over. Yeah, I, so I have to say, I really don't know. These are somebody's, so this is blog dash lane. Uh, but you look at other sites, you get other numbers. So I'm gonna tell you, I really don't know. But in general, they'll tell you it's expensive. Uh, people require being victims. Uh, and not only do phishing attacks attack uh, businesses, but they also sometimes attack individuals. A lot of these things coming up. Uh, FBI says there are 22,000 incidents involving American businesses. That would not account for the numbers you saw before. And losses are way over the billion, way over a billion dollars a year. So, okay. Basically, it's social engineering. Social networks, your Facebook, LinkedIn, my, you know, Twitter, all these people are out using those as mechanisms for phishing, asking you to give them information. And it's happening all over. And a lot of it's more successful than others. Uh, it's been around for quite some time. Uh, I guess in the 1990s, people started doing phishing attacks against AOL. Uh, that was an early, uh, what was it? It's America Online it provided uh, internet access for a lot of people. Uh, so uh, that and other ones, once against bank, bank uh, banks are always big targets. Says Jesse James says that's where the money is. So, and then there was the one cry uh, ransomware attack. The ransomware was initially uh, started by a phishing attack. Here's a chart I got from somebody. Doesn't say it. But it's a oh, statistic, I believe. It creates this uh, unique phishing attack. You can see it's getting bigger, bigger. This only goes up to 2015. Uh, trying to find information is kind of good. Here's a more recent chart, but you can see it's just climbing up there. Uh, as you can see, more and more phishing sites. And of course, there's non-computer phishing. People can do it uh, uh, calling you up on the phone. I get phone calls. I get phone calls, people telling me, I'm from Microsoft and I'm here to help you. There's a problem, you have to do something. And I know it ends up with going to their website and giving them some information. I played along one day just to see what they were doing. They're very convincing. They have you go out to the task manager, look up the services, and you see that some of the services are disabled. Well, of course some services are disabled because some services don't apply to your computer. If you don't have that widget on your computer, you don't need it, you don't have that service. They go, oh, it's, viruses have disabled these things. You need to come to this website, sign in here, Give us your credit card number, we'll fix it. Yeah. And of course, they always ask for your banks. Also, uh, they can use text messages. Uh, yes, text messages, of course, are small, these small message systems, what runs text. Uh, and so, small message system phishing is smishing. People spend all time. And here's an old one the late Nigerian banker. That's, I don't know why. Niger the one favorite one, I guess, Nigerian prince. I might point out Nigeria has a federal republic. They don't have kings and princes, but you get emails from Nigerian princes. Anyway, uh, there's another one, email phishing. This is pretty clumsy. Uh, there's a prettier one that I'm making this. Here's one I got not too long ago. Uh, a lot of them will tell you they're from your uh, email system. It, they sometimes propagate around A&T. A&T's IT department will quickly respond telling you, nope. Uh, don't believe this. They also filter these out. They have a very sophisticated email filter. And as soon as they find something that's illegitimate, they start uh, filtering those out. One of the things that makes these work on the websites and email is the link you see on email or website is not necessarily where it goes. Uh, let's still talk a little HTML here and HTML and A. Uh, 
provides a hyperlink. Uh, href is the hyperlink reference. And this is where it's going to go when you click on it. So you can see, if you click on this link, it's going to go to www.evil.com. And here is the text that's going to be presented. And I just put www.nice.com. So on the HTML or an email or the website, it's going to appear as www.nice.com. Isn't that a nice thing? You can click on that. It should be safe. But in fact, when you click on it, it goes to www.evil.com. Hard to see. But under most systems, if you put your mouse over that, uh, down on the bottom of the email, if you have oh, if you have the status bar turned on, you should have the status bar turned on. Uh, it'll tell you where it's going to go. By the way, if you want to create these, and you might want to in the future, uh, you can uh, select the link in your email as you're writing it and go Control K. And this is the Microsoft Word, Microsoft Microsoft Office environment. Control K says I want to modify a, a link. And then you can type in what you want, where you want that link to go. And you, so you can change what's going to be displayed and where it will actually go. You can change that. I noticed, by the way, uh, most phone browsers do not provide the feature to tell you where that link is going to. So phones just go. Uh, there, are, there are some sort of legitimate reasons for why you, why you might not want that link to actually be correct. Uh, at here at AT, as email comes in from other sites, they modify the links in your email so that it doesn't go directly to where you want. So say you have a link that goes www.acme.com. Instead, it goes to a Microsoft safe link checker, like a server that looks up www.acme.com in their database and says, do we know this to be a malicious site? If not, well, then they forward your let your request on to acme.com and you connect to acme.com as you want it to. On the other hand, if their server database says acme.com is a dangerous site, then when you click on it, it will pop up a warning message in your email saying, this is known to be dangerous. Do you really want to go there? And you should probably click, no, I do not want to go there. And it's part of Microsoft's uh, system, advanced threat protection system, part of their uh, malware protection. Uh, there have been efforts to make phishing illegal. Uh, oh, gee, was that 16, 17 years ago, uh, Senator introduced the Anti-Phishing Act, and it was make it illegal to create fake websites or you know, try to uh, look like it comes from another company, but in fact, it's not. Send bogus emails. You could find you up to a quarter million dollars, put you in prison for five years. It did not pass. Some uh, fishers have a big lobby and they didn't want to pass. So yes, that's, I always thought that was interesting, it didn't pass. Uh, but nevertheless, files can, or can, companies can do civil lawsuits, not criminal, but civil lawsuits against people who uh, try to uh, make it look like they're using their website. So if you go out to, to uh, fakeacme.com, Acme can decide to come back and sue you. There have been some uh, tag, some legal remedies. First one, first uh, Fisher attack was a California teenager way back in 2014, uh, who was trying to uh, steal credit card information. Apparently he was somewhat successful, but before he got too far, they caught him. Uh, and uh, I think they sent him to jail, or at least gave a big fine. Uh, Oh, okay. Uh, so here's another question for you. Click the polls and... All right, there we go. What do you think about this? Okay, let's see. Oh, hang on, hang on a second. Oh. My fingers are so clumsy. Press the button. All right, there we go. Gotta point it my direction. 
Gotcha. Okay. All right. Uh, yes, most of you said C. This would help, but it would cause problems. That is true. The Microsoft Advanced Threat Protection System wouldn't work because their emails point to another system. I kind of I used to say this would be a big fix, but it doesn't always work. Uh, I, I think it'd be. I think there should be at least a warning that this doesn't go where I say it's going. But that's my that's my opinion. Oh, and oh yes, uh, there you can see how you did. Uh, yeah, probably would cause some problems. Oh well, I was mentioning in class that somebody said that even if. It carefully pointed out that the link displayed on the screen was not the link where it's going to go. A lot of users, because a lot of users don't make good decisions, uh, would probably click on it anyway. And I think you're absolutely correct. Uh, you can lead a horse to water. <laughs> okay, ransomware. We talked a little bit about ransomware before. Uh, ransomware will encrypt your files so you can't access them and then ask you for money to get them un to get them decrypted. Uh, they like Bitcoins because Bitcoins are more or less untraceable, uh, cost a lot. They said seven and a half billion dollars in 2019. And the initial attack often comes through phishing. Phishing is the most common oh, vector for attacking this. Another one they use was Windows Remote Desktop. Uh, here's the chart again. These are in millions. I don't know if you can read the numbers. That's 638 million. It kind of went down, came back up. This is, by the way, it's the first half of 2022. So, yeah, you expect it to double that at least. So somewhere up there, so maybe even bigger. So it's it's the big thing. Ransomware is where it's at. Uh, it's quite successful. Uh, not only do the ransomware attackers attack companies, they attack regular users. Charge them a couple hundred bucks to get their laptop unlocked. Uh, here's some statistics I got. 73% of organizations report they were attacked. Now, frequently they could repel the attack, but they reported they were attacked. 40%, almost half their attacks were successful. Almost half the time when they detected an attack, yes, they got it. Now, there were probably a lot of attacks that weren't successful and were not detected. Somebody tried something, didn't work, just blow the radar, they went elsewhere find somebody who's not as well protected. Again, you, know, you don't have to outrun the bear, you just have to outrun the guy next to you. You don't have to be totally secure, but if you're more secure than the other places, the attackers will go elsewhere. 25% uh, of the victims paid the ransom, and most of them were paid in Bitcoins. Now there are, some of these places are very sophisticated. They're in other countries, countries that don't seem to care, uh, some countries where uh, enough money will make the make the local law enforcement turn the other way or work with you. Um, and because a lot of people don't know how to pay in bitcoins, you had to have support. So they have uh, phone support. You, can, you know, oh, if you can't know how to pay, call up their hotlines. They'll tell you how to pay the ransomware. You know, have help testing it. And a lot of these things are uh, kits. We haven't talked about kits. Uh, by the way, 94% of the people get their data back after paying because the ransomware people, it's a business. They don't want you to think you'll never get your money back. They want people won't pay. But if you if word is out that, yeah, if you pay them, you get your things back, the people will pay. Uh, okay. Uh, FBI gives this tip for avoiding ransomware, which is probably a good tip for avoiding almost any malicious work. First of all, keep your operating system and all your applications up to date. Because as uh, Apple and Microsoft find problems, they put out fixes. Uh, you wanna get those fixes in before people start you, attacking you with those problems. Um, make sure your anti-malware is up to date and it should update all by itself automatically and that it scans regularly. Back up your data because ransomware might go out and encrypt everything. Well, if you have a backup, just clear your system, re reload your operating system, reload your files and your backup. So what, there you go. Uh, and of course, in order to make this effective though, your backup should not be physically connected all the time to your computer. Uh, we, you, know, you can buy backup systems. There's third party 
back up the systems you can buy that start up at a particular time, uh, find the files that have been changed since it last backed them up and copy them across the network to their server in the cloud. If malware comes along, it's very hard for them to infect that server in the cloud. Uh, and of course, any business should have a plan. What do you do if you've been attacked? How are you going to recover? Because uh, if you just go, oh my, I never thought about what to do, you're not going to react quickly. If you have a plan, you know what to do, you can put that plan to action and go out and fix the problem. And again, it's ransomware people are there to make money. This is a business. Uh, you can buy ransomware kits for a couple hundred bucks. Or if you don't feel like buying, you know, if you're not smart enough to write your own ransomware, you can just subscribe to the ransomware. You know, pay these ransomware developers 50 to 100 dollars a month. They'll provide support, you know, helplines, and they give you, you can buy the uh, ransomware from someplace, go to another place on the dark web and buy uh, passwords, put them together, and you've got yourself an attack. You don't have to do anything, but you can go out there and make yourself some money. And again, I think I talked about this, watch the links. If it's too good to be true, it's not true. Uh, user education is primary. Um, also, secure sites. If you're going to where you think you're going, it should be locked. A lot of these things try to, uh, uh, phishing emails try to evade the phishing things. An interesting way to do it is instead of putting text in the email, they'll put text in a graphical image. The anti-malware system sees that there's a picture, but generally can't tell what the picture is. And so it lets it go. And of course, humans can read the text in the picture and they'll do what it says, just like it was written text. Although some are getting smarter and smarter. They, the uh, security systems now have optical character recognition. So they read the pictures looking for text. And if they see something, they can do that. Uh, Website forgeries, one of the things they do for websites is they'll pick a name that's really close to it. Here's, you know, again, you want www.trusted.com, somebody might come with www.trusted.evil.com. It's on the evil.com network, uh, but you might not notice that. You see the www.trusted, you know, dot ends with dot com. Yeah, that's right. Click there, it's okay. Uh, and again, uh, www.trusted.evil.com will have their own digital certificate. So, they can use it. It goes out to HTTPS, it looks perfectly legit, but it's not. Uh, we read the paper by, uh, hopefully you looked at the paper by uh, Ken Thompson. Shut up. Uh, oh, sorry, somebody should, somebody should turn the phones off when they come to class. Uh, about the uh, Ken Thompson paper, how he tells you how you can hide bugs in the compiler. I also have the quote there, a well-installed Microsoft bug would be almost impossible to detect. Microsoft, uh, microcode is the firmware, or even the microcode is the firmware in your CPU. So if somebody's gotten into the CPU firmware for say your Microsoft or your ARM system, you'll never know. And it can be very, very dangerous. Uh, the Thompson paper uh, talks about writing programs that replicate themselves. It's an interesting computer science challenge. I gave it a shot myself. It is interesting, it's not possible. I managed to get it to work. Uh, I had problems with quotes. You know, you had to go backslash quote, and if you go to backslash, anyway, the backslashes tend to propagate. I found it just, I made a variable uh, that I called a quote, and I gave it the numerical value for a quote, and then I could just append it where I wanted quotes. Okay. Well, that's it for now. I'll call you back in a minute. Uh, so. uh, but uh, that's it for today. Reminder, course evaluations are out there. And for those of you here in class, one week from today, online only. Okay. All online. Yes, well, there's a test on Wednesday. So. Okay. That's it for today. See you next time. Test on Wednesday next week. Yes. Next week. Next week, Wednesday. Test. I'll be talking more about it next week. You know, Monday. So I keep getting this phone call from actually somebody who I have to really talk with.
I will put on a practice exam. It'll probably be out next weekend or well, this week. Well, okay, I'm sorry. I was I'm teaching a class in the middle of class. Maybe we should turn off. And I kept 